Church this morning. I'm Pastor Tim, and I'm so glad that you are all here this morning. Here at Lighting Spear Church, we believe that we are called to be God's healing and hope-filled congregation, to make followers of Jesus Christ for the positive transformation of our community through our lives of prayer, love, forgiveness, honesty, acceptance, and trust. We're glad that you are all here this morning. I have a helper this morning as well, Miss Melody. Uh, today, uh, we're excited as we are moving into part three of our series on the book of Colossians. For the last few weeks, we've been studying Paul's words as he reached out to a group of people who were struggling with their understanding of who they were in Christ as they were being led by um, the, all of the various thought groups that were going on around them, made mainly this philosophical group of people that believed that everything material was bad and everything spiritual was good, and they later became known as the Gnostics, Gnostics with a G. And so today we're going to continue our, our, I guess I'll call it listening in to Paul, because Paul may not have been writing directly to us, but I think that what he was addressing directly impacts us in our lives today as we're surrounded by so many different viewpoints and so many different ideas that we can find Christ as our center and Christ being all that we need in our life, as the, and that's the primary theme of the, of the letter to the Colossians. Um, so as we move into this time of worship, I would remind you that later on during the service there's going to be an opportunity to pray together as a community, and if you have some prayer concerns that you don't want to share out loud within the community of faith, I'd invite you to take the prayer request form out of the back of the, of the seat back and fill that out later on during the offering. Just put that in the offering plate and it will go to myself and to the prayer team as well. Um, let's, let's start this morning in an attitude of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship, to be in this place with all of these people, to just center ourselves as we begin this new week. God, we ask that you would, would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your Son, Jesus the Christ, that we would have him as our center, that we would know that he is all that we need. God, bless this worship, be present in this place and in this space and in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus, the Son, the Christ, that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Let's please stand as you are able and continue our worship and song.
please be seated. This time I'd invite our kids to come forward as we have a few minutes together. Come on, John, you can come up. It's fine. He hasn't heard you yet. He's not heard you. Right. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about a few different things um, in the message. And we're going to be talking about this concept of Christ living in us, which is a really hard concept to think about. So here's, here's a thought I have for you, uh, a question I have for you. Have you ever been reminded or told, like, you remind me of your mom? About you remind me of your dad? You remind me of your brother or your sister? You're just like uncle so-and-so, and so-and-so. You have your mother's eyes. You have your, your dad's curly hair. You have you, those, those types of things where people look at you and they are reminded of someone else because you have some traits that they do. I know that all of you do have traits that make, you, make people remind you of other people in your lives, even if we don't say it, that's it. So here's the thing. The reason why we do that is because when someone looks at you and they say, man, you remind me of your mom, or you remind me of your brother, the things that you do or the way that you look makes the person who's watching you think of someone else like that, right? Like, John, you're acting just like Christopher. Ever heard that? No? Ah. Weston, you remind me so much of Uncle Ben. Melody, you look just like your mom. No, you say no, but there are things about you that do that. Well, here's the thing. When we talk about faith and having Christ in us, it's the same thing. What we try to do is we try to be like Christ, to live a good life, so that when people look at us, you remind me of Jesus. You, What you're doing in your life, the way that you're acting is different. It reminds me of someone else. And I know it's kind of hard to think about now because Jesus had a big beard and you guys don't have big beards, right? Because all the pictures say so. I kind of do. Yeah. No, that's just a joke. We don't really know what Jesus truly looked like. But we know the things that he did. He was good. He was kind. He was helpful. He was wise. He had self-control. He was gentle. And when we do those things, people see that image of Christ in us. And that's our goal. It's not that we go through life and we remind each other of our moms or our dads or our brothers or our sisters. It's that when people look at us, they see us and they see that better thing. Which is the best way that I could come up this morning with how to explain Christ in me. When we say we want to have Christ in us, it's not that there's another person in us. I'm stuck inside you. No, it's that when people look at us, they see that greater thing in us. Now, I, I guess, not like Venom, but kind of, because Venom <laughs> eats eight people's heads. Yeah, and that wouldn't be good. That would not show gentleness. Uh, all right, let's pray together, shall we? Let's put our hands together like this, like this, like this. Just do something with your hands as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the ability to be with you in our lives. Help us to show the world your love through our actions so that when people look at us, they see an image of you. So in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and everyone said, Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming up this morning.
Well, friends, today we are continuing our series on the book of Colossians. We're going to continue to look at Paul's words, um, written from prison. Paul was in prison at the time of, of writing these words, the people of Colossae. Um, and the people there are a people who have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And have been transformed and have started this new community of Christ followers, people of the way. However, amidst their community were groups of other people, intelligent people, um, who were trying to understand their place in the world. And, and as such, the, the philosophy of Gnosticism was born as intelligent people dug deeply into the practice of faith and in an attempt to logically rationalize God and humanity and the relationship between the two, which is a, a feat that is very challenging. You can ra rationally, logically analyze God and humanity in the quest for salvation. Um, we should sit down and talk because I have a lot of questions. Last week, we took a deeper dive into the beliefs of the Gnostics and how their belief of all things matter was evil and all things spiritual was good. And how that belief system created a, a heresy in the church that what they call, scholars call the Colossian heresy. Um, as all people do, intelligent arguments often fall on open ears. When someone can intelligently and articulate and in an articulate way, tell you, well, here, let me explain to you why it is the way it is. It's easy to understand why the people of, of Colossae were, were somewhat confused. Because it wasn't just blindly following, they were actually saying intelligent things that made sense. And it's under this context that we find Paul writing to a people that have been influenced by the different thoughts and studies of the world around them. So today, the text that we're going to look at and continue in um, has a central truth of the secret, I will say secret of the faith, because the Gnostics believed there was a secret that only they knew. They had the, the knowledge that no one else had, that all they had to do was achieve this knowledge to achieve salvation. And so Paul writes about that secret, the central idea of, of this knowing and belief. And I believe it's something that we live in today as well as people of faith, as we quest for that secret understanding, that knowledge of Christ and our relationship with God. And so let's jump into Paul's letter to the Colossians, starting in chapter 1, verse 24. Paul continues his correspondence, his conversation with Colossians by saying this. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard of Christ's affliction for the sake of this body which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing, and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy of Christ so powerfully working in me. So the central theme here in, in, this, in this passage is found in verses 26 and 27. I'm going to go back and just read those two verses. Paul says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the revelation that Paul wants to tell the people. The big secret that is no secret. The big thing that we all have to remember. The one thing, the centrality of the gospel, everything that you need to know rests in these words. That Christ is in you which is the hope of glory. 
This is so important to Paul that when we go through and look at all of Paul's writings, so all of the epistles, all the letters he wrote, in amidst all of those letters, Paul references Christ in you. This concept of Christ being in us, the indwelling of Christ, over 170 times. My mom always told me that if something's important, you're going to say it over and over again, right? If you're going to teach your kids, you say it once, you say it twice, you say it three times, you say it a hundred times. The most important things. Paul says Christ in you, or refers to the idea or the concept of Christ being in us over 170 times in his letters. In those letters, Paul has a simple this definition of what a Christian is. Basically put, he said, a Christian, a person of the way, a person who follows the teaching of Christ, is a person of the way of Christ. Someone who is in Christ. The greatest reference throughout Paul's letters that I, I believe is, is found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And Paul says it this way, I have been crucified with Christ and I live no longer, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the revelation that Paul was reminding the people of Colossae about. That Christ lives within us. And because of by Christ's indwelling, that's the theological term that scholars will use, indwelling, the indwelling of Christ, Christ living in us, we have a new hope, and that hope is glory. So to understand the meanings of these words, and what it, the full revelation, what does it mean that Christ is in us? I always struggled with this as a, younger, as a younger person. What does it mean that Christ is in me? Because logically that's not possible. But that doesn't mean it's not real. To begin to understand that, we have to understand that Paul's belief and understanding of God was that God had been at work throughout all time. God was at work through all time with a plan and a purpose, right? That God had worked all the way through the Old Testament, and even though we struggle with the Old Testament at times. And, and even before the Old Testament documents were, were found and, and, and recorded and used, before all of that, all the way back to creation, God had a plan and a purpose. And that plan and purpose had something to do with us as humankind. Paul believed that throughout history and the history of humankind, God had been working on a plan. The idea that God had been at work throughout all time and, and with a specific purpose was key. That purpose, Paul believed, could only be discovered by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. But we would only understand purpose of life when we understand, understood Christ. And God's work in our lives. And I think the same holds true today. You know, we, we come to know Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we come to understand God in a new and real way. In the process of it all, Christ comes to dwell within us. And this is a theological concept that, that is central to our belief as Christians. So let's take a minute, or five, or ten, <laughs> And look at the indwelling of Christ. And what it means to us as people of faith. And as we do, there, there are four things I'd like to look at this morning. And the first is that we are recipients of Christ in our life. This is what many will call the, the center of the Christian experience. That Christ... Paul reminded us last week in the text was, was at the beginning when all things were created. Christ, who was in all things, the firstborn of all creation, the image of the invisible God, the head of the church, is received into our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. His dwelling in us is the hope of glory. And we talk about this moment of reception of Christ in, in a lot of different ways, depending on our backgrounds and our upbringings. You know, we say we receive Christ, or we invite Christ into our hearts, or we, we surrender our lives to Christ, we give ourselves to Christ. Um, but regardless of, of those words that we choose, the, the point remains the same. There is an action that takes place of Christ coming into us and becoming a part of us. We receive, we're recipients of something. 
For me, when I think about this concept of Christ coming into our lives, I think about stories throughout the Bible. Because I, I think that the, the scriptures give us more pictures of what this means and what this looks like. Because this isn't the first time that God has tried to save his people, right? God has tried over and over and over to, to, to save his people. I think of the story of Moses, right? With God reaching out to his people, God manifesting with his people. You remember the story of Moses? Um, God comes to the people and dwells with them, and he, he's expressed through like a storm, kind of. Charlton Heston is up there um, in front of the Red Sea, right? I'm not the only one who watched that, right? He's present in the storm. But, in Scripture, he's also present in the tabernacle. If you read through the Genesis, Exodus um, accounts, we find God present in this, this place called the tabernacle. He's in the Holy of Holies. He's there in the center part of the tabernacle, and when God is there, a cloud descends. And only Moses and Aaron and the, the, and the specific people could go in and approach God in the Holy of Holies. And I, I like the, the imagery and, and the concept of God being in the tabernacle. Because in other parts of Scripture, we read the same thing. In the beginning of John, right, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God, and the Word and the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. Right? That beginning of the Gospel of John, the author says, God dwelt within them. And if you look at the Greek, the word dwelt has, a, has another meaning that I think connects a whole stream, stream of events. To dwell is to tabernacle. To tabernacle means to tent. I'm going to pitch a tent, and I'm going to stay there. And I really, I personally really like that imagery, that, that God is going to a place, and he's setting up camp. He's tabernacle, tabernacling. He's, he's staying in this tent that he's put up. And that directly correlates with our experience of receiving Christ in our lives. Christ comes into our lives, and makes a home, builds a tent, as it were, throughout the Old Testament, and dwells within us. So we receive Christ in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we, we, all kinds of things happen, and all kinds of theological terminology comes into play. You know, we're saved, we're reconciled, we're forgiven uh, by His grace. All of those things, but we are made anew. Christ then lives on through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's within our search for our understanding of this communion with Christ that we grow in our relationship. And we say, what does it mean that Christ is in me? What does it look like that Christ is in me? Why is it important? It's in that searching toward that deep knowledge of Christ residing within us, whether it's here or it's here whether it's in our head or in our hearts, that we begin to grow in our relationship. But without that reception of Christ, without the indwelling of Jesus into our lives, we're not able to grow into his likeness. Like, like I said to the kids, right? You remind me of Uncle Ben. You remind me of your brother Christopher. You remind me of your mom. Because a part of who they are is a part of the people that are in their lives. I like to think that, like, my, my middle boy, Weston, has a little bit of Uncle Ben in him. Because that would explain a lot. <laughs> you all know Ben. You look at Weston, admit it. You look at Weston and you see him. Hair color's not right. Hair color's not right, that's true. But it's the same thing with Christ. That we would be looked at and people would see Christ. If Christ is not a part of us, then we wouldn't, no one would be able to make that connection. Secondly, we are not only recipients of Christ, but we are also communicators of this great mystery of Christ. Paul says it in verse 28 here, he says, 
He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And I know, the proclamation of faith is not something we all want to do. And that's okay. It is okay. For some, pro the proclamation, the, the speaking, the talking about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection with other people, it is what we're called to do. I like to think that that's something I'm called to do, that, I, that I'm, part of who I am is to help communicate who God really is. But that's not what all of us are called to do. I think for most of us, our lives are the proclamation. How we live and what we do is what shows the image of Christ to the world. There are those throughout history who are these great preachers and teachers, the missionaries traveling the world that do this amazing work to save hundreds of thousands of people and lead people to faith, but let's be realistic, that's not most of us. We're not, we're not those people, that's not our calling, but I have found in my life that it's the pillars of faith the people that have led by example, that impact individual lives, that truly communicate Christ's love on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the greatest communicators of the good news of Jesus Christ in my life have not been preachers and teachers. They've been people who have impacted my life by showing me God's love. showing me what a, a life transformed truly looks like and how love can be shared. There's people like, like Wayne Summers, my high school drama teacher who believed in me and encouraged me, who took me to church camp as a counselor, who showed me that I can be me and still be used by God. It's people like Jerry Bennett who can be in a Bible study and completely disagree with someone on a theological level and then come to the end of the meeting and hug you and say, I love you. Some of the greatest communicators of Christ's love and what it means to be a person of faith are the people we live with every day that live out that life of love. that we could all be that kind of communicator. Those people in our lives who have shown us the way. That we could communicate the mystery of Christ to the world so that the secret of our connection with God wouldn't be a secret, but would be known because people see us. Thirdly, that we suffer so that the secret of Christ would be known. We know by the history of this text that Paul is writing these words from prison. So there's, there's, a, there's a backdrop to what he's saying in this, in his own personal life, the suffering for Christ. I think there's a reality that we have to face, that there is a price that has to be paid when we share Christ. For Paul, it was being imprisoned because he went against the teachings of the established church. Even today, there's a measure of suffering that comes from communicating the message of Christ. Even though maybe you're labeled as one of those God-loving people. Today, just like thousands of years ago, the message of Christ runs contradictory to the established values in the heart of the world today. Just like back then. It's countercultural. It contradicts the views of our current society. But in our individual suffering, Christ becomes known to the world. And as the body of Christ, us, the body of Christ, His church, Christ lives in and through us as a whole. And something kind of amazing happens. Our suffering becomes God's suffering. As Christ lives in us. What we suffer, God suffers. And at the same time, Christ's suffering, God's suffering, becomes our own. Now, I don't mean that the suffering on the cross, I don't mean that we 
all have to die on the cross. Because that was a one and done thing. None of us have to die on the cross anymore. Because Jesus did that. That's not what suffering means. It's not that we have to physically die for our faith. No, our suffering often comes when we put God's will in front of our own. Because we are, well, I won't say we are, I am a selfish person. I want what I want. I assume you all are much better than I am. So it's something only I have to deal with. But the suffering that we endure often comes and is manifested when we put God's will in front of our own. And God's will supersedes ours. When we place Christ first in our lives and above our own ambition. Lastly, God's power, the will of Christ works in and through us. So just quick review. So, so far we've said that first, we're recipients of Christ. Second, we are not only recipients, but we're communicators. Third, the secret causes suffering of a kind. Fourth, God's power, the will of Christ, the will of God works through us because God is in us. One of the deepest cores of our experience of God in our lives is when Christ dwells within us. And we become conduits of God to other people. Those, those pillars of faith that impacted us. When God works through someone to impact someone else. Not because of who the person is, but because of how God is. We become God's power in the world. And, I, and that's, that's a hard thing to say because it's not like we become these superheroes of faith. We don't become like... someone with a cape and a shirt that can jump over buildings with a single bound. It's not the kind of power that we talk about when God works through us. But it's the real power of God's strength in our world. Things like the fruits of the Spirit become a part of our lives that are shared with the world. Things like kindness, goodness, self-control, and ultimately love. Just as it was written in Scripture, Scripture. To think about this for a minute. We love because God first loved us. Right? We all know that passage. The fruits of the Spirit. We are gentle because God was first gentle with us. We are kind because God was first kind to us. That is an expression of this indwelling of Christ that is then sent into the world through us. Those fruits of the Spirit aren't our actions, but ways that God has worked through us in the lives of others. We love because God first loved us. It's, it's different words for the same concept. That God resides in us, and because He's in us, and because we suffer with Christ, we are then conduits that channel that love into the world. And this is not... simply a philosophy. This is not simply character traits or ideals that we try to embody. It's a person. It's Christ. The living embodiment of God within us that becomes that conduit. So Paul goes on to say, I want you to know how hard I am Contending for you, for those at Laodicea, and for all who have, who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and unit, united in love, so that they may have the full richness of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. 
So then, just as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elements, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So Paul says a lot here. Don't be deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Don't be captivated by hollow, deceptive philosophy which depend on human traditions and elements of spiritual forces. Directly going against Gnosticism. Don't be deceived. Remember that it is Christ, Christ alone, who lives in you, that strengthens your faith, that lets you be overflowing in thankfulness. That it's Christ that has brought you to fullness. So understand that Paul is not anti-Paul when he says this. He's not against people seeking knowledge and understanding. Because it sounds kind of like he is. Don't worry about philosophy. Don't worry about all of this other stuff. But that, that's not really, truly what he's saying. He's speaking against Gnosticism. He's not anti-philosophy because Paul is one of the wisest people in the age. He's well studied. He's well versed. He has a large understanding of what's going on. And in his wisdom, though, because he studied and he experienced Christ, in his wisdom he knew what was the most important thing in life. At the same time he understood the drive for knowledge in life because he was a scholar. But Paul came to realize something that we also struggle with today. And it's the same thing that the people of Colossae also struggle with. And that is the meaning of life. Why we exist. What is God? How do we exist with God? The most important thing, the meaning of life, is not the accumulation of knowledge, as the Gnostics would say. To know everything. Paul is saying, knowledge cannot give you purpose in life. No matter how much you know or claim to know, we do not think our way to reality. We experience it. We experience it. Knowledge is important, yes, but experience is also important. If you were to hire anybody today in the current market, I was interviewing a few people this week for a position we have at my, my, my job, and we were looking at someone who had this much experience, this much knowledge, and then we looked at someone who had this much knowledge, this much experience, and then we looked at someone, you know, it was, they both hold meaning, but there's something about experience that outweighs all learning. Because experience is the foundation of our lives. We live, we love, we laugh, we experience life together. It's our experience of life, not our knowledge of life, that gives us wholeness and fullness of life. Picture this, if you will. Just brainstorm. You read a book about being on the beach during a rainstorm. And the author paints all these pictures about how beautiful it is. The rain coming down on the water, the breeze, the trees blowing. And you read the story. Versus, you stand on the beach. You experience the rain. You feel the wind and the trees blowing back and forth. And you're a part of it. What is more real to you? The experience of the rainstorm? The story of things. For us as, as human beings, experience is an important part of our life. I've never sat on the bedside of a person with a person at the end of their life 
who wished they could have created a better rational, logical argument for the meaning of life. It's never happened. Not saying it couldn't, but it has not happened yet. It's the experience of life that we live for. It's the experience of life that we dream of. It's dreaming about going on that vacation that we've always wanted to go on. It's, it's wanting to experience the fullness of life. And it's that experience of life that we remember. People don't often remember how smart other people say they are. They remember how they were treated and how they lived together. And in the same way, Paul's understanding that knowledge of God is important, but it's not the culminating of life and faith. Paul knows that it is the experience of God that makes us grow in faith. It's the experience of God that changes our lives and transforms us into something new. We, and we need to think clearly, yes. We need to understand concepts and we need to have a knowledge of the divine, yes. But we also have to live within that knowledge. We have to live fully in Christ. See, it's, it's kind of a blending of the two. It's a both and. It's not an either or. Which is why I always have been drawn the Methodist faith tradition because of the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which was actually not a work of John Wesley, it was actually a work of Albert Outler, Albert Outlier, that says that when we experience God, like when we come to understand God and we try to, to approach something theologically, we have to look at four things. We start with Scripture, Scripture being the foundation, the Word of God that's given to us. And we take what we know of the Word of God and we put it in balance with the traditions of the church. The history of who we have been and are as a people of faith. And then at the same time, we take into balance with the scripture and tradition our experience of God. How have you experienced God in your life? And across from that, we put our reason. Our God-given ability to think, to decipher, and then together with scripture and tradition and our experience of God and our ability to think about who and what God is, we approach that topic. I, I like to think of it as like a four-sided um, seesaw. Scripture comes first. Our tradition balances it. Our experience of God and our reasoning skills all come into play as we try to examine and understand God. Point being that to fully understand God in our world and in our life, we must find a balance between what God has given us in Scripture, balanced against the history of the church and its tradition, weighed against how we have personally experienced Christ in our lives, set aside or set with our own rational mind and reasoning. And we put it all in balance together the scripture is our foundation, we then begin to understand how God works in our lives. And how Christ is that conduit, that experience of God that fills us up on the inside in the places where we have always searched for meaning. And it's more than just a cliche of that oh, God-sized hole in our heart. But that God fills us up in that inside part, whether it's in our heart or our minds or our whole body that we we become empowered then by God, that God uses us to channel into the world. Paul is telling the Colossians that, yes, it's important to think, but it is more important to recognize the experience of Christ in our lives, that Christ is at our center, and because of that, our lives are new. And because of that, we impact the world around us. Now next week we're going to look a little bit deeper into what it means to be made anew in Christ. Because Christ is in us, we become something else. But that's another 20 minutes of conversation that we don't have time for today, so we'll, we'll save that for next week. But the important thing to remember today is that because Christ is in us, we impact the world around us. Because Christ is in us, People look at us 
and they recognize something else, something greater. And it's not just, you remind me of your mom, you remind me of your dad. It's a picture into something bigger than us. And that's my prayer for us today. That we would all find ourselves filled with the power of God through the life of His Son, Jesus the Christ, through the sustaining presence of the Holy Spirit, so that we would be for the world Christ, the vision of Christ that others need to see. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, as we move into our time of prayer together, there are a couple of prayer concerns that we have that are not listen, listed in the worship folder. Um, you can read through those at your convenience. Um, one, I wanted to let you know that, that Ann Lincoln did pass away last night, so please keep the family in your prayers throughout this week. Also, Paul, it's great to see you. this morning that we would like to lift up together. Joe's sister Sandy is having health issues. trips home and abroad. Yes. If there's nothing else, let's go to God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for being a part of our lives, for coming into our hearts, for being our center, for using us for your will, we thank you that when people look at us, they can see you because of who we are. God, help us to be that light that shines for others to see. And not be hidden, but visible to the world. God, we come to you this day with, with heavy hearts, hearts with prayer, hearts with praise. As every day is a new day. Lord, we ask specifically this morning that you would be with the family of, of Anne Lincoln as she passed last night. We praise you that you would bring her into your open arms to rest in glory with you. Lord, we thank you for the return of so many people in our lives. Lord, we lift up Sammy with her health issues. Lord, that you would bring healing and hope into her life. Lord, with all of our veterans here, home, and abroad, Lord, that you would provide safety and comfort. As those who are away or missing home, Lord, we ask that you would just bring a sense of hope and love into their lives. Let someone's light shine to them so that they can feel the presence of you and the presence of God, we ask that you would be with all of us in our unspoken prayers. And that which we would lift to you, but want to lift to you silently, Lord. We ask that you would hear our prayers and heal our hearts. All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray, and he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for This time I invite the praise band to come back to the front as we continue in our worship.
with a song of response, leaning on the everlasting arms. So I would invite you to stand as you are able. family. Um, so if you have noisy Sunday offerings, the bucket is up front throughout this month. Um, and we don't know who the family is yet or how many kids they have, but um, we do want to start that collection. Um, also on the back wall, we've moved our sign-up sheets onto the wall on the clipboards um, so that they're easier to see what they are. Are there any other announcements this week? That yeah, we have an, update. an update on the blood drive. We had a successful blood drive Tuesday. Thanks to all the volunteers. Uh, brought in goodies to eat and also gave blood and helped out. Uh, we had 34 people uh, present to give blood and we had 32 good units that were donated. So it was a very good, successful drive. And thanks again to everybody that helped out. Yes, thank you for if you helped out on the blood drive. Really appreciate it. It does save lives. Anything else this morning? All right, let's close our worship this morning in song. We'll sing My Lighthouse. Please stand as you are able. Thank you. 
dismissed from this place, but we're sent out into the world. So go this morning with the words that God gave to Moses, that Moses gave to Aaron, that Aaron was told to tell to his children. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and grant you peace. Amen. Go in God's love. Amen.